Hi, and thank you very much uh, for having me. Um, I know this is always difficult for um, people from outside of Germany uh, having names with umlauts, so thanks for pronouncing the name perfectly right. Uh, my name is Peter Götz. I am a software developer, and um, there are two things that I, I currently do most, and these are architecture and DevOps. And so I would like to talk about the combination of these two things in the next 45 minutes. Um, it would be great if you had some pen and paper ready, because if we have time, I would like to uh, send you into a little reflection by the end of the talk so, you, uh, so that you will be able to get something out of it. Um, I always like talking, but uh, as, a, as someone who is in the audience, I usually like if someone else is talking and then I can take something away uh, from the talk. So um, since I'm a software developer, I think the first thing we should do is we should uh, define the terms we are using. Um, and so the first term uh, that I will be using is software architecture. What is software architecture? Um, you can look it up. Um, there are tons of different definitions out in the field. Um, I, I don't like most of them because they become too scientific. Uh, they become too theoretical. Um, but there are a few, um, a few quotes that I really like and I would like to give them to you. The first one is by Martin Fowler. Um, and it says, software architecture is about the important stuff, whatever that is. And I like it because it's very fuzzy um, and also very clear at the same time. Um, so uh, if, if, if we do something and it is important, no matter why, he calls it software architecture. A bit more concrete is a definition by Eoin Woods. He says, software architecture is the set of design decisions which, if made incorrectly, may cause your project to be canceled. And I like that because it's quite funny. Um, so Eoin Woods uh, says it has to do with risk, right? So um, if, it, um, if it can cause your project to be canceled, uh, that means it is about the decisions that are risky and uh, the important stuff is usually money. So it's the, the, uh, the, the important design decisions. Um, or we can also uh, say uh, it's about the significant design decisions. And um, to make significant more clear, uh, it's measured by cost of change. The second thing, and this also has to do with uh, software architecture, is um, the question of uh, what is the difference between software design and software architecture? Um, and I like um, what Grady Booch says about this topic. Um, he says, not all design is architecture. Architecture represents the significant design decisions. Here we have it again, the significant design decisions that shape a system where significant is measured by cost of change. And that means, in the end, not all architecture is design. Uh, sorry, it's a, it means that all architecture is design, but not all design is architecture. Um, I've created this little Venn diagram to make that complicated matter really, really clear. Um, so when I talk about software architecture, I mean design decisions that are uh, having a high cost of change um, and that are risky, therefore. The next question is, what is DevOps? And um, with DevOps, it's a bit difficult because the term has never been uh, formally defined. Um, the so-called, let, let, let's, let's call them inventors or, uh, or um, the, the thought leaders on DevOps, they refuse to define it because they say the, uh, the term would become stale, then, it would become rigid uh, and, and not changeable anymore. A bit like what Scrum ha has happened to. Um, because Scrum is very, very well defined with the Scrum Guide um, and the inventors of DevOps, they wanted to um, avoid something like this, that people go, uh, go all over the place and say, well, this, this is not DevOps, this is not right what you're doing. Um, if there was a definition of DevOps, I think it would be the three ways um, defined by Gene Kim and his uh, co-authors in some of his books. And these are, the first one, flow and systems thinking. Um, so we are trying 
to optimize flow of work through our value creation chain. Uh, we are trying to visualize and to, um, um, to work with the whole system of uh, value creation, not only with our tiny um, silo uh, that, we are, that we are living in. The second way of DevOps is uh, about feedback. Um, it's called Amplify Feedback Loops, and that means that we should install and um, uh, um, amplify feedback loops wherever we can. So the most obvious one is if we have improved flow from left to right, um, then we could have a feedback loop from right to left, right? Um, but to be honest, that's not enough. So what we need is we need feedback loops all over the place. We need feedback at every at every uh, um, uh, instant of our value creation chain in order to avoid the wrong things being happening. The third way is to create a culture of continual experimentation and learning. And maybe the visualization that I added here is not the best one, uh, because um, having, a, uh, having a boat strand is maybe not the nicest thing uh, uh, and is not something that uh, encourages your, uh, uh, your experimentation and learning. But it is a, a way of learning how to navigate shallow waters. Um, and so in the culture of continual experimentation and learning, what we are trying to do is we are trying to create an environment where this stranded boat uh, is not happening. So we are trying to create an environment in which an, a failed experiment is not catastrophical. Um, it is just a, a way to learn and to improve ourselves. The three ways are very well known, um, uh, but I would like to step away from them for a bit because i would like to talk about the five ideals um, the five ideals are um, uh, something that gene kim described in his latest book in the unicorn project and um, since it would be quite boring i guess uh, if i would just tell you about the five ways uh, the five ideals of devops um, i will try to illustrate um, uh, the the points with the story for most of them, I have a concrete example. Um, and, and then I would like to talk about what does that mean to, for architecture and maybe what does that mean uh, in terms of DevOps. So bear with me. Um, so it's, it's mostly just me telling a story and you looking at a, at a picture. So the first, the first story is something um, that I have seen at a customer in the past. Um, I was part of a team creating a, part of a German government website. Um, it was part of www.bayern.de. Uh, so it's B the, Bavarian, the Bavarian government uh, uh, official website. And uh, we implemented in a very small team one application. We developed that for the uh, government of Bavaria. Um, and, um, and one thing that we did architecturally, because, um, because we, we, we needed to, to set it up from scratch, uh, one thing with, that we decided on that we wanted to do it with boring but proven technologies. In our case, that's like 10, 12 years uh, uh, back. Um, in our case, that was Spring Hibernate uh, on Tomcat. So that was very well known to us at that time. Uh, and I will tell you why uh, we made that decision. The first decision was all the developers who, who, who um, were going to be on that project were familiar with technologies. So we did not want to create uh, uh, tension. We did not want to create confusion um, in, in, um, in terms of uh, people having to learn to know stuff. And, and this is important, everything that we needed was being offered by this technology stack. So um, it was adequate for our requirements, um, at least the ones that we could already uh, that we could already see. Um, it was also easy to onboard new developers since we were going to to hand over this system to our customers. The important thing was that they could take over without too much of a hassle. If we would have taken the nicest and shiniest and, and most uh, interesting things uh, of technology at that time, most probably. Um, that would have uh, made for a much harder handoff uh, and for a much harder um, onboarding of new developers. Another thing uh, why we cho choose that, that stack is a very practical one. Uh, Tomcat had already been part of the productive systems in that, uh, uh, in, in that part of the German government, Bavarian government. Um, and the administrators and operators were able to run it and monitor it and, 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 and get meaningful stuff out of it. 
The second thing is, and I already mentioned it, Tomcat is quite easy to monitor. So uh, um, at that, even at that time, uh, um, that it was super simple to get the stuff that you wanted to uh, out of the out of the system, both from the core of Tomcat um, and from the uh, application that we put on top of it. Another thing that had to do with uh, the application itself um, is the long lifespan that we expected this application to have. So if you do something for a startup and you are creating um, um, a demo for something for, 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 for one of their applications, it is most of the time it's perfectly fine to, 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 to use some fancy and, and, and very new technology because the life expectancy of this uh, application is typically not that high, even though we all know that um, uh, the, the things that you do as a quick and dirty hack, they are the longest uh, living uh, pieces of, uh, of, of systems uh, imaginable. But here we expected a long lifespan. And so we wanted uh, a system that is able to cope with the uh, development. And so we choose something that already had quite some history and that we expected to have some more in front of it. And so um, and I, I honestly don't know if this system is still in place. I guess it is. Um, I have tried to find it in preparation uh, for this talk, uh, but it has at least changed into a, into a, bigger, uh, into a bigger piece of application. Um, but I could, I could imagine that it is still running on the same basic stack uh, that, of technology that we had uh, created. So the question now is, what does this have to do with um, both architecture and uh, DevOps? And the answer is, the first strategy that I would like you to take away from this talk is to keep it local and simple. Um, if something is simple, easy to understand, easy to change, easy to set up, easy to hand over, uh, chances are high that this will improve or this will help you improve on all of the three ways of DevOps. You will make for a better uh, flow because it's simple. Um, you might be able to install feedback loops more easily. You might also be able to design an environment where uh, change and, uh, and learning and experimentation is, is, is easy. And so uh, the first strategy um, is to keep it local and simple. Local is the other one oh, so, so simple we covered local is about um uh, how can we how can we ensure that we are not um let's say dependent on too many outside factors um if a team by and in itself is able to mostly uh, uh, work with uh, value creation and mostly deliver that value that is typically uh, um, a, a high Let's say it, it, it's a target you want to achieve because um, what we gain by that is we uh, uh, become free from dependencies. We are more easy uh, um, and, and, and easily able to, um, to, to do the stuff that we need to do in order to make our customers happy. That's the first strategy. The second example I would like to share with you um, is, uh, uh, is something that I cannot tie back to a specific customer or a specific environment I was in. Uh, it's more like a general, I think it's a general theme uh, that, that I experience in, in many environments. It's the problem of either having too much or um, having no documentation at all. Um, and so it's about documentation. Um, the, the, the problem can be maximized even more if uh, the documentation is there, but it's outdated. So uh, no matter how much documentation you have, if it's outdated and reality is different than the documentation, that's really, really bad. And uh, what I have started doing in the last few years uh, with my customers and with my own uh, systems that I uh, um, developed for myself and for, my, for the companies I'm involved in, is that I try, and we are focusing on the hard on the hard things. We are focusing on the um, on the important stuff. Um, I'm trying to create documentation that fills the gaps that the source code still leaves open. So um, some people say that source code is the only documentation, and and source code is the the final truth. And yes, that's true. Source code is the final truth. But it does not tell the story. 
Um, source code in the end is harder to grasp than sometimes it's harder to grasp than something we write up in a in a sentence in a paragraph or in a small article. And that's why these things that are hard to see and hard to understand from the um, source code, they should be documented uh, because they most probably are leaving uh, are delivering the bigger picture. We have to stop though. Because um, if we add too much documentation, we, we again have the problem of, of, of too much to absorb and of uh, having the documentation outdate too quickly. And so what we are trying to do is to, to, to fill the sweet spot of having exactly enough documentation to understand the bigger picture, but not too much information so that we hide the relevant, uh, the, the relevant facts behind them. One more thing that I've seen in the past, I as a developer, I'm a very lazy person. I don't like uh, uh, writing documentation, at least not if I have to search on a, on a, on a drive somewhere uh, uh, for the right version of the Word document and then open it and then realize, oh, it's last change was three years ago by a, by a person who is not even in the company anymore. And so by that time, I, I, I just don't want to write documentation anymore. What we need to do instead of that, we need to have documentation close to the developers and we need to have it uh, created by developers. And by developers, I mean the scrum way of saying developer, everybody who is involved in creating the value for the customer. So no matter if you are an, you can have technical writers and they are creating documentation in a regulated and very strict environment, that might be the right a way to do it, but uh, software developers, they should be able to document their own important stuff, um, i.e. software architecture. A few ways to do that. Um, one thing that I uh, like a lot, um, and uh, I hope he's, uh, he's here, um, uh, is docs as code. Um, I first heard the term by, um, uh, by um, Gernot Starke, and I think, uh, I think that uh, Ralf Müller uh, has, a, has written a very good book about that, and he also um, uh, maintains the doc tool chain. Um, and, and so I can only recommend to have a look at that. Um, what does docs as code mean? Docs as code mean that we uh, treat documentation just like source code. We write it in an easily diffable text only format. We have integrated it into our CI CD build pipeline. Uh, we are able to render it uh, into different output formats for different audiences because it's very different. If I want to have a, a demonstration or I want to have a, let's say a presentation of our software architecture in front of some board of directors, or if I want to onboard a new developer, I will show them two different pieces of um, documentation. Most probably the content can be uh, compiled from the same sources. Um, examples to do that are uh, Structurized DSL by Simon Brown. Um, uh, please have a look at that. It's an awesome uh, piece of technology where you can uh, not only uh, have the text stuff, but also the models um, uh, maintained in a, in a text-only format. Uh, one thing that most of you most probably know is uh, the ARC42 documentation template uh, developed by Gernot Starke and Peter Ruschka. Um, and uh, um, I like all of their templates in the different formats. What I like most is the easy uh, ASCII doc template uh, because that can that's easily in included in the build and deployment pipeline. So what are the consequences if we do that? Um, if we are trying to have the documentation as near as possible to the developers. Um, uh, what we are doing is we are trying to avoid unuseful and unnecessary work. Um, in the terms of one of my favorite colleagues, uh, he always says we, we, we should avoid yak shaving. Uh, imagine a yak, uh, it's a big, big piece of uh, cow um, uh, living in the Himalaya. Um, and if you try to shave that, beast, uh, that would be a, a hell of a work. And once you're ready on the, on the one side, you can start on the, on, the, on the other side. So avoid yak shaving, not doing stuff that doesn't make any sense, and um, uh, having the code as near to the developers and uh, only documenting the right things, that's the important, um, the, the important things. So what does that have to do with DevOps? In fact, it's the second, um, it's the second ideal of DevOps, uh, and I would formulate it as the second strategy. 
So you can take away, if you can work with focus, flow, and joy, that is quite, quite a thing. Um, focus on the right things, flow in order to, uh, um, to, to be able to do stuff, be, be self-contained, local we called it in the in the first uh, in, in the first um, ideal enjoy and while i wouldn't go as far as saying that documentation brings joy to me um, i would say that not having documentation removes a lot from the joy uh, that i usually have when working on software and so introducing the right amount of documentation increases joy uh, because it, it it avoids removing joy Let's go to the third one. The third one again is a is an example, and this is an example that most probably sounds weird on an on a on a conference uh, about software architecture, because what we are what what we were trying to do, and and this is not yet the weird part. Uh, what we were trying to do is with a customer, we were trying to break up a Java double E uh, monolith into smaller and vertical services. So we are, we were trying to create something that we might call a modulith. Um, but, and that's the important thing, uh, we tried to adapt and change the architecture in very, very small steps um, because we, would, we wanted to avoid a big bang. In that company, uh, big bangs never worked. Um, I would say they almost never work anywhere, but that company explicitly uh, forbid to do something in big chunks. And they said, uh, let, let's make it easy. Let's make it simple. Let's try to find a way um, where we can um, where we can improve the state of the system in small incremental steps. And so, what we were trying to do is we were trying to find one very simple service um, where we could learn a few things. Uh, we wanted to learn how to work with this new decomposition of a service that is beside the big mon monolith. We wanted to learn how to communicate, how to com communicate uh, inside the system, um, so in, inside the monolith and together with uh, with the uh, um, extracted service. We uh, wanted to learn how to deploy and run it. So that was something new for us. Uh, uh, we only were used to deploying application on running infrastructure. Um, and uh, what we also wanted to do is we wanted to learn how to keep the overall system stable, even when parts of it are unavailable or are producing errors. Uh, because what we have with a, with a modulithic application, we have several things that can go wrong. So if you have one piece of, uh, um, of application, it, uh, it, it fails, then yes, you have a failed system. Uh, if you have two pieces of uh, um, application or, or of system, then both of them can fail independently, but you do not want the overall system to, uh, to fail when each of those parts um, is uh, going down. And maybe you have realized it, I use the word learn a lot. Um, because that's the most important thing that we try that we try to do with the first uh, separation of uh, service from the mon monolith, and that's why we uh, selected an absurdly simple service to learn. What we did is um, we uh, we extracted a service that was called the salutation service. Um, it decided for a person you gave in into it, a user you gave into it. It decided how to how to uh, say hello to this person. So it, it, it's a it's a Mister, a Missus, a Miss, um, a Professor, Doctor, whatever, and that in several languages. So. Very, very simple service. Um, it was a helper class um, before, before we extracted it. Um, uh, but the good thing about that, it was very easy to extract because we, by the end of the day, it was just putting some boilerplate code uh, around, um, around the, the helper class. Um, the consequences that we had, um, or let, let, let me start with one more thing. Um, what we also did here, um, we did not, extract uh, so we extracted the service but we did not um, uh, simultaneously shut down the helper class what we uh, did we had a uh, we had them run in parallel for uh, quite some time because um, what we wanted to avoid is we wanted to avoid uh, having to touch all the hundreds of different uh, areas where this uh, helper class had been used. And so um, uh, we, we did it incrementally. We started with one uh, specific uh, um, with one specific 
um, business case. Um, and there we use the new uh, the new service. We could learn from it. We could experiment a bit. We could we could see how it reacts, uh, um, uh, how it how it runs uh, against uh, performance and stuff like that. And so by the end of the day, what we did was we operated the old and the new paradigm um, of the solution in parallel, which means that once we had started, we could incrementally improve the overall state, but we should not stop. Because if, if once you stop uh, and, and once your product owner, at least that product owner was a person like that, once your product owner realizes that you can take on more of the other work, um, they will give you more of the other work. And so uh, what we uh, did is over the course of a few weeks, um, we have uh, worked on this in small steps. Uh, we have made progress uh, incrementally and iteratively, and every small change had improved the overall system and made the further improvements more easy. So the second service that we pulled out was already uh, quite uh, quite straightforward. From the third on, we just did it uh, because we, we knew how. The ideal that is hidden behind that is the first, uh, the third strategy that you might want to take away. You should try to improve your work every single day. So it's not like uh, um, like we do one big improvement uh, and, and by the end of the year um, and then we are done uh, with our improving. Um, very small improvements every day make for a big improvement by the end of a huge time span. The next one is a negative example. So uh, this is something that I have seen at a customer, and it was a very sad. Uh, um, uh, it was a very sad, let's say, story um, uh, um, or episode. Um, and I would like to use it as a counterexample um, uh, to to show how in, how important it is to uh, avoid something like that. You could summarize it as um, this company has destroyed in one instant um, an initially good error culture. Um, there were a few managers, um, they were leading parts of the ops department um, or, uh, or ops of the op operations cohort, let's say. Um, and those leaders, they tried to actively create an ex a healthy environment without blame and punishment. They encouraged their um, employees to try out stuff, um, to, to fail if necessary, but to make sure uh, that we learn from it and that this will not happen uh, next time. And then a severe outage uh, uh, occurred. Um, and this severe outage was, uh, was had to be handled uh, above this uh, uh, ring of leaders. Um, and a superior manager from the um, main branch of this corporation, uh, they came in and they demanded consequences. They said, this is unacceptable. Uh, such errors cannot happen. We cannot uh, let this uh, happen uh, um, without any consequences. And that's why we need to fire the person uh, responsible for the outage. Um, and this is the, the one good thing about this story is the managers of this person, they refused to do that. They said, no, we will not fire him. Um, this is impossible. We, we cannot talk about uh, error culture, blameless, uh, and no punishment uh, for years. And then we just dis destroy it like that. But they had to show some cooperation. And so they took away uh, privileges. Um, that was uh, um, back in a time where uh, working from home was a, a privilege, <laughs> not something you had to do. Um, and so the privileges to work from home, they were taken away from this person. This simple thing destroyed and eroded the trust in the company, and it impeded a lot of things. Necessary uh, uh, changes, um, bigger changes, we can call them architectural changes. They were executed hesitatingly. People were trying to wriggle out of that. Uh, um, they were uh, um, sometimes not tackled at all because people were too afraid to break stuff. And individuals and groups tried to not expose themselves in the company. So they tried to do the easy stuff. They tried to do the day-to-day the, the, the -day work. They tried not to get the assignments on work that were hard to implement and that were difficult to implement because um, uh, they, they knew or they feared that if something goes wrong, um, they would be the next whose privileges would be cut. 
since architecture is all about the decisions that are risky and hard to change, um, one thing that is very important, and this is the, the fourth strategy, uh, one thing that's very important is psychological safety. So you have to create an environment in which everybody can feel psychologically safe. Um, if this is not there, um, we are most probably, um, uh, we are not able to, to do the, let's say, the, the hard things. We are not able to create, uh, in, in the third way, breaking things and learning from them, uh, create an environment where experimentation and learning is normal. And, and this is, I think this is mostly a leadership uh, um, topic, um, but that doesn't mean that a leader is someone high in hierarchy. Uh, I think everybody of us is a leader um, and, 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 and leadership is needed to lead by example here, um, to create that psychological safety. Um, next one. The next one is um, very important to me personally because uh, it is a startup I have co-founded last year. Um, we are trying to uh, make agricultural products climate positive. Climate positive means uh, we are trying to um, overcompensate 20% uh, more um, uh, um, carbon um, and store it in the ground than is emitted by production and, um, and um, logistics up to the um, stationary uh, groceries. Um, and in, in this startup, we are doing everything from scratch. So uh, everything is new. Everything has to be uh, uh, decided for the first time. And so there is a lot of important decisions to take. And one thing that's important is uh, neither of my colleagues and, 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 and nor myself, uh, we are uh, from agriculture. I mean, I have an agricultural business um, because I am a beekeeper. And in Germany, beekeepers are by law agricultural uh, companies, uh, but that's more of um, insurance reasons. Uh, it has nothing to do with uh, me being a, being a farmer. So what we need to know and understand, we need to understand our customers. So we need to understand how farmers um, are working uh, in their day-to-day -day, uh, lives, how, uh, how what, what kind of pressures uh, they experience, what kind of problems they experience, what kind of things they would like to achieve. And we need to speak their language. Um, the quality goals our system needs to achieve have to support the value for our customers. And everybody of us is learning a new language. I have learned a lot of German uh, uh, um, words for uh, um, for soil and crop and 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 uh, and um, uh, fertilizer and stuff in the last few months. Um, and these quality goals that we are trying to achieve for our um, customers, they drive the architecture. So every decision, every hard and important decision that we make, are. Uh, based on the um, on the on the question, does this help us uh, achieve a specific goal, a specific quality goal? Obviously, we have to make trade-offs. Um, architecture is all about trade-offs uh, between quality goals. Um, so we have to decide which trade-offs we make to achieve the most important quality goal. Um, and architecture. And we all know that I hope architecture is not an end in itself. So we are not doing architecture because architecture is so nice at least not only, but we are trying to do that because we want to achieve something. We want to deliver the quality that our customers expect and need. And since we have to use our customer's language throughout uh, um, uh, the, the whole communication with the customers, why not go one step further and uh, use it uh, uh, even in the um, even, even in, in, in our technical environment? Um, Ideas like domain-driven design and its ubiquitous language um, uh, are important things to support that. Um, and uh, I, I can only, because I was in, in Matthias Bohlen's uh, talk uh, before, uh, I can only second him. I never know how you, how you, um, uh, how you say ubiquitous. I hope it's, it's correct. Um, but what is very important is that we have this understanding, uh, um, let's say, going and morphing into the systems that we create. Uh, Domain-driven design and its ubiquitous language, they are great uh, helpers there. 
Architecture patterns like hexagonal or onion architecture, they can help us as well. They can help us encapsulate uh, the most important aspects of our systems and make them and, 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 and separate them from the unimportant, um, i.e. technical things. Um, so, um, um, so, so this is something we try we, we, tr we try to separate the technical stuff from the business stuff inside our um, architecture. And um, I mean, at the moment, we are a very small team. We are five, five founders. Um, uh, we have uh, already one employee and we are planning to, um, to hire a software developer. But once we are growing, um, we have the opportunity um, and the chance of uh, building up the teams and their co collaboration and structure them around the different uh, uh, the different um, systems and the different let's say domains that we are working for the different contexts that we are working in. So what does that have to do with DevOps? It's the five uh, the fifth ideal of uh, DevOps, and it is the fifth strategy that you want to take away from uh, um, from this talk. It's to focus on your customer. So um, it's, and this is very easy to forget uh, in the day-to-day -day life, heads down, uh, working on a specific problem as a developer. It's very easy to think in technical things, but we, we should go one step back and we should try to focus on our customers. Fifth strategy means the five strategies that I wanted to present to you are already done. Um, there is one thing I would like to do, and it is close a circle. The second way of DevOps, <laughs> amplify feedback loops. Because I have, uh, um, I have asked, what is DevOps? But we have answered with uh, three ways of DevOps, and I would like to answer it in a slightly different way this time. I would like to add uh, and summarize the five ideals once more. The first ideal of DevOps, locality and simplicity. It means that we should try to keep stuff local encapsulated um, and, and well-defined. And we should try to keep the things simple in order to be able to handle them better. It helps us on the first way of DevOps uh, increase um, increase flow. It also helps us on, this, uh, on the third way of DevOps, uh, creating an environment of experimentation and learning, uh, because uh, locality and simplicity help us uh, create an environment that is not too complicated. The second way of DevOps is about focus, flow, and joy. If we as people working with technology, if we as people working in software architecture, if we have joy in what we do, that's a great thing. If, and this joy can be created by being focused on something, having good flow, um, good, good workflow, because that helps us to uh, become confident and experience joy in our day-to-day um, -day work. The next thing is, and I hope you start realizing that the picture on the right shows how these different things uh, work with each other. Um, the third ideal of DevOps is improvement of daily work. So one very small improvement every day is more important than a big improvement um, by the end of the year. Uh, think New Year's resolution. Uh, um, instead, and instead of that, uh, try to do one very simple thing every day. The fourth one is psychological safety. What we are trying to do is create an environment where everybody can feel safe, because only if we can feel safe, we can be creative. Um, and creativity is the foundation of working uh, as a software engineer or as a software architect, uh, because uh, all of this is creative work. Uh, we we create stuff out of nothing. Um, and last but not least, customer focus. Um, and every one of these five ideals um, is connected with every other one, uh, with all of the other ones. So uh, by improving one of them, you most probably influence the others as well. We have five minutes left. Um, I would like to give you a very small chance of reflecting what I just said. Um, and um, to do that, take the pen, take the paper that you have already prepared and think for one minute, uh, where is a connection between DevOps and architecture in your specific environment? 
could be your customer, could be the company you're working for. Where is uh, the connection between DevOps and architecture and your environment? Hi, <laughs> hi, <laughs> I'm in Peter. Um, so thank you very much. While we wait for people to 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 think about um, this connection, um, we have a couple of questions. Um, so first question, let me get it. So where should we start using the five ideas in my architecture? Okay. If possible, I would like to, um, to, to, to ask two more questions and then I will come back to this question. Okay. Yes, let's see if there are more questions from the audience. Okay. Um, because before we go to that, um, um, and, and I, want, I, I, I was talking about the questions that I have prepared. Um, the second thing, and this is connected with the first question that I have asked, uh, asked you, is why is the, this connection you have, just, um, you have just thought about important to you and to your team? And take 20, 30 seconds to think about that and write down why is this connection important to you and your team? For everyone, you can write a comment here on the chat section. Oh, yes, great. If you want to share, that's an awesome idea. Thanks. <laughs> and the third question, and this is the most important one, find one thing that you can do to improve your architecture by using DevOps strategies. And this is, I, I know that I can't see if you are doing it or not, uh, but I, I strongly encourage you to think about that question and really write something down um, because uh, um, this should be your, your gold nugget, your one takeaway from this talk. And I hope, I hope you have one. Uh, one thing that you can do to improve your architecture by using DevOps strategies. And now, I think I'm ready for your questions. So <laughs> what would you like to know from me? Yes, we have two questions. Um, where should I start using the five ideals in my architecture? So this is a very uh, difficult question because there is not the one place to start. Um, it's just like the three ways. It's not like you start with the first way and then you go on the second and then you go on the third. Um, with the five ideals, it's more like um, a hy it's hy hypothesis driven. So you think about the question, where is the biggest pain currently? Is it with simplicity? Is it with flow and joy? Is it with customer focus or anything else? And then you try to improve one small thing there and then see how the overall system reacts. Do we have other questions? Yes, we do. We have another question. So what are the typical parts in your experience in which software architecture and DevOps tend to bump heads? I think um, the I think most of the time when uh, this happens, um, it is because of misconceptions and misunderstandings. Um, so what I can see is uh, a lot of companies still have the the thinking that stuff happens in in phases, um, and we do one thing after the other, and we do architecture very early, and we do operations very, very lately. And we just call our ops people now DevOps, or we install something in front of DevOps, and in front of ops that is called DevOps, and that creates another silo. If stuff like this happens, then most probably stuff will clash. Um, mm -hmm. because, uh, because we will have misunderstandings, we will have yet another handoff. And that's why I like the five ideals of DevOps, because they are more concrete than the three ways of DevOps. And they help to, um, they help to make transparent um, things that we as developers, we as team members need on a day-to-day -day basis. And I, I think this, having this overall understanding helps us avoiding um, to, uh, to have that clash of software architecture and DevOps. Perfect. So we have one, someone from the audience, Marcus, who replied to your questions. Should I read it for you? Cool. Yeah. So Marcus said to question number one, simplicity of deployment. 
to question number two, to deliver value fast. On to the third question, to ask Debs, uh, Debs about uh, the biggest pain point. And that's great, Marcus, because that's a tiny step. Um, it's one thing that uh, um, uh, that, that my, my colleague always calls baby steps. We need to work in baby steps um, because baby steps are very simple. And just like a baby, if you I, I don't know if you have kids, I have three, um, <laughs> and, and they are already above the baby step grade. Um, but when a baby takes a step and falls down, nothing bad happens. Mm -hmm. They are well padded at the back. Um, and so uh, so what happens is they stand up and they try again. So ask your devs about the biggest pain point and de de depending on what they say, try to work with that and try to relate it back to the five ideals to the three ways. Great, okay. thanks for that question. Perfect, thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> thank you, so thank you, uh, Peter, for being with us today. Um, so you're going to stay in the conference, right? We can find you via chat if there's someone who wants to ask a question or something. Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, we will finish uh, today and I mean, for now in 15 minutes we have the following talk. So um, grab a coffee, <laughs> grab some water and then we will see you back in 15 minutes. Thank you uh, so much, Peter, and see you later. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.